Book nine. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him. O great Alcinous, preeminent among all people, surely indeed it is a good thing to listen to a singer such as this one before us, who was like the gods in his singing. For I think there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant than when festivity holds sway among all the populace, and the feasters up and down the houses are sitting in order and listening to the singer, and beside them the tables are loaded with bread and meat, and from the mixing bowl the wine steward draws the wine and carries it about and fills the cups. This seems to my own mind to be the best of occasions. But now your wish was inclined to ask me about my mournful sufferings, so that I must mourn and grieve even more. What then shall I recite to you first of all? What leave till later? Many are the sorrows the gods of the sky have given me. Now, first, I will tell you my name, so that all of you may know me, and I hereafter, escaping the day without pity, be your friend and guest, though the home where I live is far away from you. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs, and my fame goes up to the heavens. I am at home in sunny Ithaca. There is a mountain there that stands tall, leaf-trembling Neritos, and there are islands settled around it, lying one very close to another. There is Dulichion and Same, wooded Zakynthos, but my island lies low and away, last of all on the water, towards the dark with the rest below facing east and sunshine. A rugged place, but a good nurse of men for my part, I cannot think of any place sweet on earth to look at. For in truth, Calypso, shining above all divinities, kept me in her hollow caverns, desiring me for her husband. And so likewise, I and Circe, the guileful, detained me beside her in her halls, desiring me for her husband. But never could she persuade the heart within me. So it is that nothing is more sweet in the end than country and parents ever. Even when far away one lives in a fertile place, when it is an alien country far from his parents. But come, I will tell you of my voyage home with its many troubles, which Zeus inflicted on me as I came home from Troy land. From Ilion, the wind took me and drove me ashore at Ismarus by the Caconians. I sacked their city and killed their people, and out of the city, taking their wives and many possessions, we shared them out, so none might go cheated of his proper portion. There I was for the light foot and escaping, and urged it, but they were greatly foolish and would not listen. And then and there much wine was being drunk, and they slaughtered many sheep on the beach and lumbering horn-curved cattle. But meanwhile, the Caconians went and summoned the other Caconians, who were their neighbours living in the inland country, more numerous and better men. Well skilled in fighting men with horses, but knowing too, at need, the battle on foot. They came at early morning, like flowers in season or leaves, and the luck that came our way from Zeus was evil to make us unfortunate, so that we must have hard pains to suffer. Both sides stood and fought their battle there by the running ships, and with bronze-headed spears they cast at each other. And as long as it was early and the sacred daylight increasing, so long we stood fast and fought them off, though there were more of them. But when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking of cattle, then at last the Caconians turned back the Achaeans and beat them, and out of each ship six of my strong grieved companions were killed but the rest of us fled away from death and destruction. From there, we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions. Even then, I would not suffer the flight of my all-swept vessels until a cry had been made three times for each of my wretched companions who died there in the plain, killed by the Caconians. Cloud-gathering Zeus drove the north wind against our vessels in a supernatural storm, and huddled under the cloud scuds land alike and the great water. Night sprang from heaven. The ships were swept along, yawing down the current. The violence of the wind ripped our sails into three and four pieces. These then, in fear of destruction, we took down and stowed in the ship's hulls, and rowed them on ourselves until we had made the mainland. There, for two nights and two days together, we lay up, 
for pain and weariness together, eating our hearts out. But when the fair-haired dawn and her rounds brought on the third day, we, setting the masts upright and hoisting the white sails on them, sat still and let the wind and the steersman hold them steady. And now I would have come home unscathed to the land of my father's. But as I turned the hook of Malaya, the sea and current and the north wind beat me off course and drove me on past Kithera. Nine days then I was swept along by the force of hostile winds on the fishy sea. But on the tenth day we landed in the country of the lotus eaters, who live on a flowering food. And there we set foot on the mainland and fetched water, and my companions soon took their supper there by the far ships. But after we had tasted food and drink, then I sent some of my companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eaters of bread, might live here in this country. I chose two men and sent with them a third as a herald. My men went on and presently met the lotus eaters. Nor did these lotus eaters have any thoughts of destroying our companions, but they only gave them lotus to taste of. But any of them who ate the honey-sweet lotus... They were unwilling to take any message back or to go away. But they wanted to stay there with the lotus-eating people, feeding on lotus, and forget the way home. I myself took these men back, weeping by force to where the ships were, and put them aboard under the rowing benches and tied them fast, gave the order to the rest of my eager companions to embark on the ships in haste for fear someone else might taste of the lotus and forget their way home. And the men quickly went aboard and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the grey sea. From there, grieving still at heart, we sailed on further along, and reached the country of the lawless, outrageous Cyclopes, who, putting all their trust in the immortal gods, neither plough with their hands nor plant anything, but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation, wheat and barley, and also the grapevines, which yield for them wine of strength. And it is Zeus's rain that waters it for them. These people have no institutions, no meetings for councils. Rather, they make their habitations in caverns, hollowed among the peaks of the high mountains. And each one is the law for his own wives and children and cares nothing about the others. There is a wooded island that spreads away from the harbour neither close into the land of the Cyclopes nor far out from it. Forested, wild goats beyond number breed there, for there is no coming and going of humankind to disturb them, nor are they visited by hunters who in the forest suffer hardships as they haunt the peaks of the mountains. Neither again is it held by herded flocks, nor farmers, but all its days, never ploughed up and never planted, it goes without people and supports the bleating wild goats. For the Cyclopes have no ships with cheeks of vermilion, nor have they builders of ships among them, who could have made them strong beached vessels. And if these, if made, could have run them sailings to all the various cities of men in the way that people cross the sea by means of ships and visit each other, and they could have made this island a strong settlement for them. For it is not a bad place at all. It could bear all crops in season, and there are meadowlands near the shores of the grey sea, well watered and soft. There could be grapes grown there endlessly, and there is a smooth land for ploughing. Men could reap a full harvest always in season, since there is very rich subsoil. Also, there is an easy harbour, with no need for a hawser nor anchor stones to be thrown ashore, nor cables to make fast. One could just run ashore and wait for the time when the sailors' desire stirred them to go and the right winds were blowing. Also, at the head of the harbour, there runs bright water, spring beneath rock, and there are black poplars growing round it. There we sailed ashore, and there was some god guiding us through the gloom of the night. Nothing showed to look at, for there was a deep mist around the ships, nor was there any moon showing in the sky, but she was under the clouds and hidden. There was none of us there whose eyes had spied out the island, and we never saw any long waves rolling in and breaking on the shore, but the first thing was when we beached the well-benched vessels. Then, after we had beached the ships, we took all the sails down, and we ourselves stepped out into the break of the sea beach, and there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn.